Hey, welcome to the Future of Science seminar, this time with Juan Benet, founder of Protocol Labs and the inventor of IPFS and Filecoin. In his seminar, we talked about Juan's visions for the next 30 years in science and technology, including how we can close the gap between scientific research on the one hand and then technological innovation on the other hand, uh, in the form of translating that new knowledge into new technologies. And in that context, we also talked about research funding, how we can increase funding, how we can make sure it's spent more efficiently. And we also talked about open source software development and how that's kind of like open science, with the exception that open source software is really a thing in software development and open science is kind of niche in science, which, yeah, not, not ideal. Um, so we explored why that is and what we can do to change that. So make sure you stick around for that part of the conversation as well. Uh, uh, great to be here with, uh, with everybody. Uh, great to be uh, chatting about this. Uh, uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, so, so I decided to kind of break up my um, my kind of view into the future into, into two components. One is um, really focusing on DSI, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And that's sort of meant to be like very near term. So think of um, the DSI oriented uh, changes uh, and the opportunity that DSI has uh, to improve science over the next say two to five uh, years. Like the technology changes now that can put in place a better trajectory for the next, say, um, five to 10 years, uh, five to 10 to 15 years. Uh, there are other technological improvements uh, to science that are going to be transcendental, uh, things like uh, all of the ML-based um, discovery and so on. You can think of uh, maybe a, a concrete example of that being things like AlphaFold um, and, and others that will just ra greatly accelerate the, the, the rate of science. Um, and also uh, kind of a vision for how we might systematize science itself um, using uh, uh, artificial intelligence and, and ML models and, and human coordination and so on. Um, and so that part, I'm going to kind of uh, separate out and kind of talk about in the future in a, a, at a later date. So probably in January or, or February or something like that. Um, the, and so today's kind of, I'm going to mostly focus on uh, DSI and the DSI oriented uh, structures and incentives and um, a, a ways of getting to uh, say reproducibility and open access and building a better platform for uh, scientists today to sort of change how we're doing science now. Um, uh, I do think that the broader conversation about um, uh, ML models and so on is going to be uh, extremely important for everybody doing science now and, and, and hoping to accelerate and change science. Um, and, and I kind of want to uh, so, sort of like separate that out into, into a separate conversation. Uh, great. So what I want to uh, talk about today is this set of points. One, um, I want to discuss science as the engine of progress and kind of why uh, it's it's key to everything we're doing um, and so on. I think this will be, uh, a, of course, very familiar to everybody uh, talking about uh, talking in this in the set of seminars, uh, but it's useful to kind of remember the level of importance that science has in our in our civilization and, and our future. Uh, and in a sense, why it's so important to improve the fundamentals of science so that it can accelerate. Uh, then I want to kind of uh, discuss what is DSI broadly and kind of give a, a bit of an overview of the, of the movement. I think a lot of people are already familiar with, uh, with the movement, but it's good to kind of um, use this moment to kind of reflect and, and look uh, look more broadly. Uh, I want to talk about funding the science commons. And so this is uh, the uh, structures that we can use uh, around DSI to be able to improve the way in which we fund scientific development and paint a picture of um, what's achievable in the smaller scale, in the shorter term, and what's achievable, say, in the, in the long term at larger scales. Uh, then I kind of want to give an overview of a, a lot of uh, different uh, uh, efforts that are going on uh, across the, the DSI landscape and maybe talk about some of the successes so far and trajectories for 2023 and 2024 that, that could be uh, pretty promising. And then I want to um, discuss kind of a, a set of concrete problems around building better tooling for scientists who are doing uh, scientific work today. So this is um, tooling around the way in which we access knowledge, um, tooling in, uh, around how we um, manage our data, how we distribute and disseminate our data, tooling uh, for how do we make uh, scientific um, uh, projects much more uh, reproducible so that people are able to um, you know, look back to papers you know, 5, 10, 20 years old and be able to reproduce the results. Uh, cool. So uh, at the, you know, it, almost on every single uh, metric of the human experience that we can, that we can think about, um, over the last few centuries, we've seen this tremendous uh, uh, range of progress. And the kind of underlying reason for all of this is the scientific revolution and the changes that have been put in place uh, after that. So 
all of the our, our better ability to understand the universe and be able to um, build technology to harness uh, uh, the environment around ourselves and be able to kind of improve the human condition has led to this um, accelerating rate of progress. Now, um, we've also along the way caused all kinds of damage both to ourselves and to and to the environment and to uh, other species and so on. And we have to kind of um, get a, a drastically better um, handle on things to be able to uh, achieve this kind of rate of progress and this kind of improvement for humanity without kind of um, damaging everything else. Um, however, the the kind of broader uh, story here is that in in just a few centuries, uh, humanity has been able to uh, level itself up and maybe even when you take the broader view, in just a few thousand years, humanity has been able to um, uh, level itself up and level its its ability, it, it, the civilizational scale um, ability to to operate in the in the world um, at a scale totally unprecedented in in uh, in in life in on this planet, right? So um, at the end of the day, what it, the the main point of this is that uh, humanity getting a drastically better way of thinking about problems, a better way of understanding the universe, and drawing. Um, abstractions that uh, can be you that have predictive power. So this means generating better explanations for how the universe work, works is the fundamental thing that is um, uh, enabling us to do what we do. And so um, in, in a sense, kind of most of our day to day attention as a species doesn't go to science, which is uh, uh, kind of, a, I think, a, a mistake in, in allocation. I tend to think about um, the you know, the, our scientific endeavors and our, and our building of technology out of that scientific endeavors as the sort of top priority that humanity should have and our broader allocation as a species doesn't quite uh, match up. Uh, anyway, so science is, tends to be divided into lots of different fields and so on. Like the divisions here are way fuzzier than um, uh, uh, we, they might, might have been portrayed. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, uh, different groups and institutions and so on that have uh, paved the way into many different areas. There's tons of areas of science that we have that we are yet to discover. Uh, all kinds of um, ways of thinking about the universe, or all kinds of physical laws, that, uh, or other kind of emergent phenomena on top that we have yet to yet to discover. So this is kind of an ever expanding um, uh, range of range of knowledge. And what uh, we need to get really good at is systematizing this um, this this area of discovery and th this process by which we uh, find things out uh, as an entire species. Ideally, leveraging all of the technology that we have in, in, in our at our disposal. So, um, as everyone sort of knows, like the scientific method method is a cornerstone uh, of kind of the individual approach to science. So, this means um, having a, a drastically better way of finding things out, uh, starting from the individual, being able to um, for, formulate better uh, explanations and, and hypotheses, being able to formulate um, testable uh, ways of falsifying those hypotheses, and that way discarding uh, bad hypotheses and so on. And arriving at much better um, structures, then from there uh, sharing those results, getting uh, peer review, um, and all of that. Now it's kind of like the, the scientific method is sort of like the individual view into it to some extent, with some hooks into into the rest of the into the rest of society. Uh, however, when you kind of think about the larger process, this is what I think is uh, tends to be underappreciated when we talk about science and and the way the science works. Um, this broader process of how we systematize and integrate our thinking, like all of the individual pieces of, uh, of science going on, and we integrate that into a larger scale model of what humanity knows and how we're, uh, what we're able to, to do and so on. Like, this is what I think is, is uh, the, the kind of like that valuable enterprise. And um, what, what unfortunately tends to be underlooked or unappreciated in terms of um, it, building systems to improve, meaning uh, there were lots of improvements in this, of course, in the, in the middle of the 20th century when uh, science sort of got systematized and, and um, built up at larger scale. And there's been a lot of kind of point solutions here and there, uh, but we have yet to see kind of a, a radical leveling up or upgrading of how all of science works at that scale uh, since. We've seen kind of incremental improvements here and there, um, but uh, for the most part, we still, still operate in um, many uh, fields and in many um, areas with the same kind of tools that scientists had in the middle of the 20th century, even though today we have you know, computers, we have like this massive telecommunications network, we're able to communicate broadly, we have um, systems that are able to understand what we are, write down and be able to generate abstractions out of that and, and so on. And, you know, for better or for worse, like the, the paper is still sort of the, the, the uh, main way in which uh, scientific results get uh, communicated, and humans are left up to sort of like parse uh, all of the uh, assessments that, that, um, that come out of papers, 
uh, plus the uh, all the, the implicit knowledge that gets um, that doesn't really get communicated in the pros or doesn't that people have to learn by spending time in the field or talking to people and, and so on. So this is the I would like to draw the attention of everybody to kind of improving this larger scale process and thinking of like entire new programs or systems to be able to plug into this structure um, or be able to kind of improve how some of these structures work in general, meaning um, getting way better at gathering data and diffusing the data or being getting better at interpreting data, um, uh, getting better at um, systematizing the uh, conclusions that come out of that data and systematizing our, our um, uh, takeaways and, and the different uh, levels of evidence that we have for certain hypotheses or for certain results and so on. Uh, that's the kind of thing that could accelerate our uh, scientific process by uh, by orders of magnitude. And I think it, this is one of those cases where this is an extremely high leverage area where if we can build better structure and better systems uh, here to um, give kind of even single percentage improvements, but ideally double digit percentage improvements in how individuals or small groups work, then you get this broad air effect across uh, the entire species that ends up yielding kind of an order of magnitude or towards magnitude improvement in, in how we do, do things. So, um, you know, design in general is, is a, a, an, a, uh, an attempt by many groups around the world that recognize a bunch of problems across this entire system um, and are trying to forge a path um, that, that is uh, kind of closer to kind of the, the, the startup world in a sense that you can go and start changing things on your own without having to um, write proposals for how to change things and get approval from mainstream perspectives. Uh, but instead, you can sort of start generating some improvements. And if they work better, then they might get adopted by, by the broader market of, um, market of potential users. Um, anyway, uh, you know, Science works extremely well for, for a lot of things, and it's been this amazing engine of progress. But you know, today we can point out all kinds of problems. There's many people that have written extensively about this. I don't need to uh, recapitulate all of the <laughs> all of the problems here, but you know, this is kind of some of the some of the kinds of things that people tend to point out. Um, things like um, having a uh, just kind of misallocated funding, um, an enormous amount of the time uh, going to uh, uh, writing up grant proposals, um, the the alignment of uh, the the processes that that pick how grants get awarded not actually being that good in terms of their selective ability and therefore kind of um, systems there have been a few experiments where like they replace sort of grant making systems with uh, approaches that are drastically more efficient in terms of time and therefore save a lot of time and money and then don't perform that much worse than than uh, they, they perform worse but not that much worse than um, than current existing systems. Um, then you get into kind of some kind of ridiculous problems like um, we just lose data over time. So um, as papers uh, age, the data for those papers uh, is hard to find. It's hard to use in some way. Um, it might not, not reproduce. The programs sort of rot in a sense because we were running on different environments today than than they were running um, back then. So over time, these systems tend to uh, start rotting and our ability to to uh, really uh, reconfirm our belief on, on those papers uh, sort of decreases with, as time goes on. And this is one of these, I, I call this kind of a ridiculous problem because we have computers, we have version control, we have um, vast amounts of, of uh, data storage and, and computational uh, platforms and so on. And we sh this should not be a problem that uh, affects our you know, most critical system as a species, like the, the system that enables us to understand the world and understand the universe and, and be able to, um, to, to do things and so on. Uh, we should have a dramatically higher standard for how we keep our um, scientific results and our scientific data and, and all that kind of stuff. And then sort of like uh, beyond that, there's you know, a problem that uh, everybody's super familiar with is all of the um, open access uh, um, movement in a sense it, where um, you know, today we're in a much better place than we were say 10, 15 years ago. Like uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, it was still the case that uh, you know, many uh, papers around the world uh, didn't have, had a sort of, a, a certain future behind paywalls uh, today, uh, many laws have been passed uh, around the world that uh, have improved that dramatically. So now we can see a pathway towards all kinds of um, uh, scientific results and so on being forced to be uh, open access, which is a great, uh, great improvement. Uh, however, still uh, when you, in practice, when you try and find a lot of the, uh, a lot of the papers and so on, you can still hit all kinds of paywalls all, all over the place um, or kind of not exactly paywalls, but friction, which in, in reality turns into economic um, friction. Um, so it is kind of a paywall, even if it isn't kind of in principle a place where a person has to actually uh, send some um, transaction of money and so on. 
and so we have just this sort of bad predatory system where uh, a set of parties that are supposed to be keeping our data and information and be able to um, disseminate it really well and be able to uh, highlight it and so on, um, A, aren't doing that that well, and B, uh, end up kind of uh, at some point rate limiting the progress of science by uh, uh, leading to uh, bad data practices, broken, broken systems, um, and just withholding access to lots of people. So this is an area, again, that is sort of ridiculous and it needs uh, drastic improvement. And the good news here is like we have all of the tools that we need to build a better system. We just it just sort of depends on um, coordinating social change around this and coordinating uh, the building of like some other alternative platforms and so on. And and to be clear, like we're in a much better place today than we were uh, 15 years ago. So if, if I were giving this this talk 15 years ago, um, I, and I have given kind of those kinds of conversations that back then, um, the situation looked a lot worse. Like this was a time when um, you know it's still sort of like seen as like a, like a massive criminal offense to to try and, and and distribute science for free, right? So this is kind of the Aaron Schwartz sort of problem. Um, now, um, if we uh, now think about kind of today and, and, and DSI and, and so on, like DSI is an approach to try and ex address some of these problems with some technologies that are available today. So uh, DSI is not going to, on its own, solve everything, and DSI is not going to, um, uh, it, it does not incorporate all kinds of solutions and, and, um, and technologies and so on um, that, that might uh, affect all these problems. DSI is a kind of a, a, a subset of, of, of approaches um, that, that, that parts from looking at what you can do when you start organizing um, these systems in, in a more bottom, bottoms up sort of way, as opposed to relying on um, very large scale institutions to sort of approve a way of doing things. Uh, what happens when you can coordinate um, groups of people, groups of institutions, groups of organizations in more free and open markets um, and in more free and open uh, environments to be able to chart a different uh, pathway? Uh, can you arrive at like this, uh, at better funding structures? Can you arrive at better ways of um, building platforms for uh, keeping our data and disseminating our data? And can you arrive at better um, environments for making science reproducible and so on? Um, many people have sort of like defined design in, in a few different ways. Like this sort of my um, uh, my attempt at it, and this is kind of grabbing from a, a couple of other posts uh, uh, from people that have that have that have gathered, gathered it. Uh, as I sort of see it, you know, design is a movement to improve science using Web three technology and tools. And there's a few you know, focus areas for the movement around open access papers, open access data commons, reproducible experiments, organizing people in labs, uh, creating regenerative funding structures that as, they, um, as we sort of invest in and develop science, we can um, flow some of the market successes of the follow on technologies and products that get built on top of those discoveries to be able to fund uh, science back uh, as opposed to kind of the, the, the sort of like a, like a a disconnect that happens today in, in, in traditional funding structures. Um, we should be able to build better systems for peer review, better incentives structures for doing the research in the first place um, and kind of producing a much higher quality day in the science commons. Uh, there's lots of different organizations and even this kind of landscape picture uh, is a few months old. Uh, so I think up to now it's maybe uh, doubled in size in terms of the organizations or, or around there. Uh, lots of different groups uh, having all kinds of different, different um, uh, successes looking at different different areas. I want to sort of like highlight here. Um, a, there's a ton of activity around the way in which we fund science, the way in which we um, organize and systematize the data, and so on. Uh, plus, there's a lot of groups that are uh, focused around organizing people uh, uh, and enabling people to have um, uh, better successes. Meaning, um, many of these groups are um, having pretty significant success by just providing an, a social environment and a structure for people to be able to carry on their work um, in, with you, in, in different uh, uh, environments. W one of the things that's very um, exciting to see here is just how broadly international this movement is. Uh, so uh, uh, growing up um, in different places in the world and having seen many different uh, institutions and how they work and so on, um, it has been very much the case that certain countries just have a, a just better infrastructure for doing science. And it's been really, really great to see that the same movement is sort of exporting um, uh, and diffusing a lot of the infrastructure to be uh, broadly available to anybody uh, around the internet. And that's a, a really great success. Um, the DSM movement in general has uh, is organizing all kinds of uh, uh, connectivity and conversations and so on through things like conferences, seminars, and, and so on. Um, and and overall, it's kind of like this larger movement uh, that is organizing people and organizations towards, uh, uh, against those goals. 
Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, funding structures and maybe both uh, the short term and long term of this. Uh, and, and here, short term, long term, I'm bounding in like the 10 to 20 year uh, uh, time scale. Not, um, not, it gets extremely hard to predict uh, uh, after that. Uh, but I think there are some like really massive opportunities here for uh, for DSI. Um, the way to sort of think about this part of the problem is that uh, in a sense that there's these two different incentive fields uh, when it comes to science and technology. Uh, and I include technology in the picture here, uh, even though I haven't talked much about it earlier, uh, because I sort of see science and technology as two sides of the same coin. Um, the science part is about how do we build systems and structures to understand the world better. And the technology part is how do we uh, translate those um, discoveries into ways of harnessing uh, the environment to be able to solve some problems or achieve some goal and so on. So by doing better science, we can produce better technology. By having better technology, we tend to do, be able to do better science. Um, science scientific history is filled with examples where building a better measurement tool or be better measurement device or building some important technology is a breakthrough enabler that then enables all kinds of uh, uh, additional science. Uh, you know, in in these days, like the most complicated um, large scale technologies and machines uh, tend to be scientific instruments. So things like the LHC or um, you know the the Webb telescope and and all kinds of uh, things that we've like built and, and deployed around the world to be able to, as a species, be able to understand what's going on. So uh, unfortunately, the the kind of economic structure around these environments uh, is kind of disconnected and is deals with two different incentive fields that. Uh, produce this problem in the middle that I sort of call the innovation chasm. In, in one side, you have the sort of academic credit incentive field, uh, and that's sort of how the world has organized academic work and, and the scientific endeavor uh, to be able to sort of um, allocate resources uh, and funding for doing work based on the likelihood of achieving certain kinds of academic credit as recognized by institutions like journals and conferences and, and peer organizations and so on. And this yields an environment that is you know, highly kind of Oriented towards publishing or perishing as a as a as a as a lab, or where uh, you greatly incentivize the production of important conceptual results, um, but not necessarily things that are going to be extremely useful downstream, um, and so on. And in particular, what, which I think is like the the really key part of this problem, it doesn't incentivize the vast amounts of work that go into translated concept translating a conceptual result into something usable to build technology and build products and actually do something. Um, so, so the idea here, uh, a concrete example might be, it incentivizes, say, understanding how optics work to be able to say something about lenses and to say something about how uh, one might theoretically build um, uh, uh, microscopes or telescopes or things like that, things of that nature. And that's kind of what is greatly rewarded in terms of uh, academic credit. Uh, but there's very little reward for actually going to the to do discover the the vast amount of um, of of knowledge that needs to be built in terms of how do you actually grind lenses, how do you um, get how do you, how do you produce more efficient lenses, how do you um, achieve better results with different kinds of manufacturing processes, how do you scale the production of lenses, how do you get what are the differences for microscopes versus telescopes and all that kind of stuff. So all of that is sort of seen as um, uh, in a sense kind of like beneath uh, academic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and conceptual uh, results and therefore like not worth uh, academic credit and sort of left over as a kind of an exercise for the implementer. And, and then on the flip side, on the other side of the, of, the, of the equation, we have this separate incentive field, which is you know, around the kind of the production of technology, um, which is much more uh, oriented by the broader market and the, ability, the larger scale uh, economic system. So these days, uh, uh, global capitalist structures, uh, you know, a few centuries ago, like mercantilist trade oriented structures, sort of in between all kinds of other um, economic structures and whatnot. But uh, for the most part, these days, you have a, a, an environment in a complex where corporations are producing technologies and products and selling them into the market. And their incentive structure yields um, <clears throat> an environment where if they can somehow uh, acquire more money by uh, tweaking products or focusing on a different product line uh, or whatever. And like, that's a, a better economic um, uh, uh, move uh, than corporations will tend to do that. And so that means that um, the kind of uh, main field, main, main incentive field for technology production is very um, risk averse and tends to try to uh, optimize for small investment changes that can yield the maximum uh, possible net um, uh, benefit economically, 
uh, which tends to produce environments that are extremely short-term oriented, extremely um, manipulative in a sense, like you can think of like um, the, the kind of like massive scale ad machine as, a, as an example of this. Um, you can think of uh, all kinds of orientation towards like digital goods and whatnot. Uh, and so you have all these crazy environments where suddenly the, the amount of money in certain sec sectors of the industry, um, which are around kind of entertainment or around um, just being able to um, uh, generate as much cash with as little investment as possible, dwarf in comparison the amount of funding that is going to certain areas of science or certain technology translation processes to take our conceptual results that we've known for a few decades and turn those into technologies or products that we can use. And so this, I think, is one of the key problems uh, over time is how do we generate better incentive structures and to bridge this innovation chasm? How do we generate better incentive structures to um, produce uh, better discoveries and better, better conceptual results across science, um, uh, but also bridge that all the way into technology translation to doing the extremely expensive part of research development, which is kind of the, the uh, less interesting conceptually uh, part of the equation, um, but in, in by, by many accounts, like the much larger labor intensive in terms of research and engineering work of doing that translation from science and technology. So this is kind of like the, the broader picture, and I tend to focus a lot of my efforts into the um, the research development area kind of downstream of where the scientific conceptual results are and in how do we do better translation because that's where I sort of see the biggest bottleneck. Um, but however, you know, most of this uh, talk and so on is about the science part, let, less the, the R&D part. Uh, however, a lot of the kind of results from DSI might apply here. And the reason I kind of talk about this in, in this segment is that this entire structure, this R&D pipeline, um, at the end of the day, even though the current market structure tends to prioritize this kind of short-term oriented investment result. Uh, it is still very much the case that if you can do this kind of really deep technological improvement, those are the, those are the kinds of products and technologies that end up being paradigm shifting and end up generating massive amounts of returns anyway, uh, at the scale of, you know, in the hundreds of billions or trillions of, of dollars worth of scale, which is what you need to then be able to fund a lot more science. So what, what, what I'm getting at is, you can create a, a regenerative uh, economic loop here where you can do um, a lots of uh, scientific development uh, and then that translation yield um, significant economic returns flowing back into the science. Uh, the problem today though, is that these fields tend to be broken up by um, systemic structures, meaning a lot of the science work is done in traditional kind of like government um, uh, funded environments and like government funders are like the main funders of science today. And there's all kinds of like limitations in, in taking that conceptual result and turning it into, into technologies. And in this kind of chasm area, it's difficult to, to also find funders for that area. So government grant programs tend to not invest in there and venture capital is too far downstream. Venture capital starts operating um, once you have something close to a product that can scale and, and so on. So this area is not, there's no like strong funding from either governments or venture capital to be able to, to flow that. And in this area, you have the biggest disconnect between the groups and um, institutions that are producing the economic results and then the later on corporations that are going to go and um, do the translation for those, uh, those improvements, building the technology that is going to turn into a product and gener generating revenue. So if we can create a way of linking these incentive structures or linking these, not necessarily incentive structures, but linking the credit attribution um, and being able to trace how some conceptual results yield certain technologies that end up doing extremely well in the market in the kind of 10 to 20 year scale, then you can build a regenerative loop that sort of uh, uh, connects these two areas and you can build a much uh, stronger way of funding science. Um, I sort of see today as like this like tragic situation where the, the sort of like fruits of the scientific enterprise are being kind of um, used all over the place by corporations generating massive amounts of revenue that never flows back uh, to the to the beginning. It just sort of like gets uh, trapped in other parts of the economic machine. And so you end up in a situation where like, even though scientific prog progress is generating all of this economic activity and economic success, um, a, a tiny fraction of that is actually flowing back to funding the science. And, and you can sort of like see this in um, the sort of like fractions of GDP that different nation states are like flowing into science as an example. Um, speaking about that, like you can sort of think about like the worldwide R&D funding as, um, you know, if, from some accounts, fairly large uh, relative to periods of time in history before. 
um, before now. Uh, however, these um, scales of funding don't quite scale with the GDP of these nations. And um, even by just looking at the, the actual scales and comparing them to similar areas of investment, you can sort of see why uh, certain things are not progressing, progressing that strongly. Um, sort of like the, the decades where, uh, where space uh, was sort of seen as not necessarily that, but, um, but kind of in a very low burn, you know, just fall out directly of the, of the uh, um, R&D funding scale for, for space as an example. Um, or our progress in energy can be traced back to the level of investment that we've put in. And, and um, one of the uh, interesting things here is that when you think about the scale here, um, the, the, the graph on the right is the, uh, the graph of the uh, non-defense R&D in the U.S. Um, across a few decades. Um, and this is kind of um, adjusted to be $20, $20. Um, you know, $70 billion a year is a very large scale amount of funding, but it is not that big. Um, like if you were to kind of think about it as an alien civilization coming to, uh, to Earth and kind of wondering, hey, species, you have like uh, woken up from, uh, from unawareness and so on and trying to uh, figure out, great, like what is your, like your research allocation? How much are you spending and figuring out the, uh, what's going on in the universe and, and how much of that turns into technology that you can use to harness the, the environment and so on? Um, you would sort of expect a much larger allocation of, of total um, economic activity. This is $70 billion a year, both doesn't keep pace with the GDP growth in, in the U.S. in this time period. So that means, in a sense, the U.S. is spending less of its money per year uh, on science, even though uh, arguably the budgets have saved, like have grown in a sense. And, um, and at the same time, it's just kind of like miss a very small location uh, relative to the impact in, in the larger scale. So if we, especially if we connect this part with what we were talking about earlier at the beginning about how science has been this massive engine of progress, you would expect a much larger um, uh, spending from all nations around the world and especially kind of the, the most uh, su successful ones economically um, in investing in this R&D R &D process. Um, and then even kind of like the amount of funding that gets uh, developed has all kinds of problems. So there's lots of papers and, and arguments and so on uh, throughout you know, the last few decades talking about um, how funding gets allocated, how competitive it actually is relative to the, to the scale of, um, um, of, of labs and people working on certain areas. It's sort of generally seen that like um, grad students is, it, it, a grad student is kind of one of the most underpaid jobs in, on the planet. And it's sort of like the running, like, um, uh, unfortunate truth of, of the environment that um, some of the people that are doing the most important work that is going to have the most important downstream implications in our civilization um, are just kind of like economically undervalued by, by the current um, way of doing things. And, you know, on top of that, like the, the grant programs themselves tend to be extremely wasteful in terms of the amount of time involved in um, producing grants and uh, reviewing them and so on. And the allocation systems are not actually that good at um, at generating different results. So like the innovation in grant making itself um, is low. And the um, th this is one of those areas where I do think that these could have a, a tremendous success here by just building drastically better grant programs that are um, A, much faster and involve way less use of time and B, um, can flow larger scales of funding associated with like very strong um, evidence of, of success over time. And, and this can be achieved by just using different structures for um, deploying capital, different structures for reviewing proposals or for reviewing merits of uh, different kinds of proposals and so on, or, or for betting on, on the outcomes of results. Like this is one of those cases where prediction markets are extremely good ideas that have been, sort of not been allowed to, to, um, to participate. Uh, so some good successes here in the last, just the last year and a half, um, it's great to see just a, a ton of groups already tackling these kinds of problems, building different grant structures and grant programs, um, special highlight to Gitcoin and the DSI uh, Gitcoin round. Um, and many groups are talking about different kinds of mechanisms that could be deployed here. So um, uh, again, Shelling Point and Funding the Commons are two conferences that talk about all kinds of different mechanisms that could be um, uh, explored. I'll give a, a, a set of examples here. So there are new kind of algorithmic ways of uh, gathering the input from many participants in a community to um, make funding allocation decisions, things like the S process or N process, things like quadratic funding. Um, then there's uh, ways of doing, uh, uh, starting to do retroactive grant making. So instead of kind of looking at a grant initially and, um, and 
only funding in order for the work to be done, uh, flipping the equation and doing instead uh, an assessment after the success has happened, uh, where it's much easier to, to tell what, what actually succeeded. Um, even, you know, and here success can include negative results that, that generate really good data and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then being able to do funding in a retroactive way. So this might include, um, you know, retroactive public goods funding structures like um, impact certificates, uh, impact markets, hyper certs, and, and so on. Uh, these particular type of instruments, I think, will be extremely useful and successful um, at, at larger scales. But we sort of like need to the time and space to generate the markets um, of, the, of that uh, scale. Uh, I do think the current macroeconomic conditions are like a huge dampener on this. And, and kind of maybe as an aside, like um, I tend to think of the interest rate as uh, the interest interest rate lever as widening or closing this chasm. So the lower the interest rates, uh, the the tighter the um, the the chasm is, and the uh, higher the interest rates, the wider this gets. So sort of like expect that over the next year, there's going to be way less funding in a lot of a lot of science and, and R and D and so on, which makes it potentially much more important to have better algorithms for allocation and and um, for producing good results and so on. Now, some of the other areas where I think like we've perhaps underinvested, but is potentially extremely promising, is to come up with new kinds of entities that can do R and D. Um, so this uh, one notable result here is the focused research organization structure that uh, Convergence Research and Animal Moral Center and a few other people have uh, pioneered. I think that this is a super interesting development in how we organize research projects. Um, so the, these kinds of entities might be, you can think of them as how do you start a lab that's going to take on some, re some research work um, and how do you raise funding for that lab and how do you administer the lab and, and how do you pay everybody involved and so on and how do you kind of think of um, being able to get grants at this larger scale um, and just kind of finding uh, another way of looking at this kind of type of uh, work is if, um, if the startup world uh, helped make it way easier to start corporations, how could we create an analogous environment for starting new scientific labs or new R&D labs? What are the dynamics of those transactions and structures that we need to improve to be able to make um, kind of smaller scale startup labs that could, as they prove success, scale in size and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, kind of the, the, the ability to innovate in the structure of, of science itself and how we organize people um, has like a much lower um, uh, innovation rate compared to, to uh, the commercial sector. And this is one of those areas where this could be an extremely successful part of DSI. By just building better structures for people to organize, this could be a great result. So uh, for example, with uh, with DAOs and, and crypto wallets and so on, you already have what you need to be able to organize a set of people with fun some funding structure and some ability to make decisions about how how, the, how to allocate the funds. And that gets you pretty far into um, how to organize a, a group of people. Now, there's all kinds of other pieces of the, of the puzzle here around, uh, great, how do, you, how do you sign contracts? How do you employ people? How do you have like um, health insurance? How do you like, uh, you know, in those countries that, <laughs> that require, that are uh, backwards enough to have to like require this uh, still, but you get you get what I'm saying. I'm try, uh, we can try and create a new um, kind of novel um, entity structure that could accelerate uh, research and scientific development by um, freeing ourselves from the um, much slower paced and much more, um, uh, I think, broken structures of like large mainstream institutions, uh, which are doing their best, but are still kind of tied to uh, a, a structure and a model um, that were designed for a different century. Um, now, thinking about uh, now, even suppose that we have better funding structures and better uh, uh, reward allocation structures and better incentives, we still and, and better ways of organizing people. We still need better ways of coordinating, and this is one of the things that I've I've just sort of been um, very disappointed in terms of how, in the last twenty years, we haven't seen that much success in how to organize large groups of people beyond kind of traditional structures that were discovered, you know, in the last century and a half. Um, and this is an area that I think needs a lot more um, uh, work. So, so I think like as an example, um, the open source movement and the emergence of version control and GitHub is an example of like building new structures that enable massive scale coordination um, at scales previously um, uh, kind of n not really uh, understood uh, as well. And so I think we're, we're missing that kind of a, uh, of a scale uh, coordination change difference in the scientific world. Um, now, of course, scientists use things like GitHub and use things like Twitter to diffuse their, their 
results and, and converse and so on and use all kinds of other um, tools and, and, and whatnot. But I think overall, the coordination structure here is, uh, has not been nearly as successful as, as say, um, the software development world with uh, things like version control, um, project management tools, and you know package managers and all that kind of stuff. So, so what are the the analogs of those kinds of structures that we could build for for scientific enterprises? Um, you know, brought in invitation here and plug for um, these the, the decent movement is just generating a, a lot of conversation about this. So, there's lots of uh, talks on on YouTube and and so on talking about all of these kinds of potential um, mechanisms and results and so on. Um, there's a lot of people interested in having a significant impact on this and. The last year alone has yielded tons of new structures and, and innovative new new ideas. Um, I think 2023 is a time to put a lot of these into action. So we've kind of spent a lot of 22 uh, putting a few of them into action and generating a ton of ideas. I think now we need to turn a lot more of those ideas into experiments uh, that we can measure and we can you know point to as as to you know what works, what what works well, what doesn't work, and and all of that kind of stuff. Um, one plug that, that I want to make here is around the generation of new kind of IP structures. So, so the you know, IP NFT from um, Molecule and Vita Dao and, and others, I think is a super interesting kind of result. I think this could be um, one of the, the, the kind of thing that could link many different um, uh, participants across this, this broader innovation chasm. Um, but, but this is like one example of, of a whole class of innovations that I think are missing. Like, um, IP is not necessarily the only way to go. There could be other kinds of instruments. Just credit attribution graphs could, could go pretty far. Um, so yeah, I plug for Visa down and Molecule as, as two groups that are that are doing this. Um, in terms of hyper certificates, it's another one that I'll highlight. Um, this is one structure that enables retroactive uh, funding of arbitrary work. And so you can think of being able to um, generate hyper certificates uh, describing sort of the impact done on a particular project. And then being able to retroactively flow funding to those uh, to those projects uh, by generating some markets. Uh, uh, this is kind of like a larger larger idea to explain. I'll just like plug it here, and, and there's a talk that kind of goes into it. Uh, great. So I want to kind of um, spend the the remaining uh, time uh, uh, talking about kind of a few efforts to organize people on projects, um, and and especially the the area of kind of open access uh, information. So this is the 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 data pipelines and the the papers and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so th there's a really good blueprints for uh, for what to do here. Uh, there are really good examples over the last uh, decade and a half. Uh, things like the homotopy type theory book uh, that got kind of built on GitHub. Uh, there's the book from Michael Nielsen that kind of goes into um, lots of different visions and potentials for reinventing discovery. These are just two examples of probably thousands of different ideas that have been out there. Um, so, so I think as a community, we've thought about the problem space really well over time. And we have generated a lot of ideas. We now need to coordinate our actions to produce these better, better kinds of um, infrastructure. Um, some good notable examples here are things like uh, LabDAO and so on, which are kind of enabling groups to form into, into teams and be able to kind of coordinate with each other. Um, also, Design Labs being able to uh, build the infrastructure to be able to um, assess the, the actual work that participants are making um, and the uh, the research that goes into a particular uh, paper and result and being, being able to interlink those results over time. So this is kind of the credit attribution uh, graph uh, stuff that I was describing. And then how do we um, flow that into, into reward structures and, and so on. So I think we can get like really far by just being able to um, uh, externalize the credit attribution graph um, and being able to link that across all of the artifacts that we make along the way, both the, the papers and the data and the um, even the insights or potential new questions that, that come out of that. So being able to kind of systematize that graph and being able to interlink it, I think will go, go really, really far. Uh, then there's, you know, efforts around kind of uh, systematizing peer review and new kinds of structures. There, there's uh, been uh, already some successes here. Uh, I haven't seen any kind of like conference come out that, that kind of uses these kinds of systems yet. And so that might be like a really good prompt for 23, which is to say um, either work with an existing conference or start a new conference or journal um, that uses DSI oriented primitives to do the entire process of um, looking, grabbing the papers, um, doing the, uh, the peer review on them, publishing them, uh, housing the papers and the, and the artifacts and the data and all of that kind of stuff, and just kind of have a, a fully end-to-end -end, um, structure for a conference or, or, um, 
or journal in a, in a DSI oriented way. And like, I think if we have a good candidate example and we make one of those in 23, um, then we'll be able to, to export those results to many other conferences in 24 and 25. Um, and you know some highlight here. There's been you know some work on how to do this already, uh, but these are kind of like still early prototypes. I don't think anybody's quite using using these yet. Um, in terms of the uh, one notable one notable result here around um, grants um, that is coupling with participation is the the Gitcoin oriented way of doing things, where it's not just resource allocation. You then get the human participation in the loop of being able to organize the supporters of various projects to come out and work with those projects directly by um, uh, lending their in individual support in kind of orienting and guiding where the pool of funding goes, but also in, in then discovering a bunch of projects through this and potentially uh, kind of going to work with them and so on. So I think like continuing to scale these, these, these uh, efforts, I think will be, will be pretty successful. Um, IPFS itself sort of began as an attempt to accelerate science by enabling um, broad distribution of machine learning data sets. And this is one of the areas where uh, we've put in place over the last um, five, five to eight years, we've put in a lot of the infrastructure required to be able to do this kind of thing and be able to move around scientific data sets, papers, and so on through um, CIDs and content identifiers and all, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so this has been like pretty successful so far. Um, and this is go going to be now scaled with the inclusion of CIDs already in the scientific literature. Like I've seen already some papers starting to include CIDs, which is great because that way you can start um, making the publication and, and graph itself um, interlinked with, with CID so that you have a, a direct cryptographic identifier identifying the particular paper or artifact or data set or, or whatever. And this is going to get way more interesting once you start thinking about um, ways of keeping all of these artifacts together and kind of governing how those artifacts um, get uh, stored over time and how you can govern the computation that happens on top of it. Uh, so, so that kind of gets into the kind of the uh, reproducible science and open access side of things, which is, um, hey, one part is you, you want to be able to move around all of the information. So being able to kind of provide free and open access to everybody around the world in terms of the um, uh, knowledge that's being generated. So just enable um, people to, to access the information. And this is already uh, working pretty well. Like there's uh, lots of large scale paper archives that uh, are moved around with IPFS um, and lots of data archives that are moved around with IPFS. Um, now, kind of a next step here is to get to reproducible pipelines. So this means being able to describe all of the necessary virtual machines and programs and so on to be able to run all of the code that um, represents a particular paper and put that entire um, set, all the, that entire set of artifacts into a single container that you can then kind of rerun. Um, and this is where, you know, Docker was seen as a good potential step towards this, but I don't think it's sufficient because Docker unfortunately it's not fully reproducible and it, and it leaks all kinds of um, assumptions. Wasm, I think, will be a drastically better uh, primitive for this where we're able to um, containerify everything related to a particular paper um, and then be able to um, isolate any kind of network access or whatever, uh, grab all of that data, and then truly make properly reproducible artifacts that you can rerun whenever to be able to reproduce those results. And what's more, be able to um, clean up and retag the data and, and improve it and so on over time. So you can imagine um, we can get to having the infrastructure and the tooling in place to be able to kind of identify all of the relevant data for a particular paper, freeze it in a sense, um, and be able to kind of move it around in a peer-to-peer -peer way um, in free and open access um, and be able to rerun it 5, 10, 20 years from now um, without kind of the risk of it kind of rotting and, and disappearing and so on. Uh, so this is one of these things where um, the people working on this have to fight against all of the traditional ways, the traditional choices that software development platforms tend to make uh, and really kind of try and create an environment that is optimizing for that reproducibility. Um, one other piece of this is getting to building computable platforms and, and to be able to do larger scale data science. Think of um, now, the, you know, I think one of the areas that 23 is going to bring is um, we, we have these large scale incentivized platforms for storage and compute. Um, now in, in, in 23, we can start doing large scale data science over these. So think of being able to do um, the kind of data pipelines involved in large scale processing of, of um, involved in, in, in uh, doing different kinds of experiments, but being able to do it, uh, you know, at the proper, you know, in the hundreds of petabytes scale um, 
and you know with massive massive scale data sets um, and then being able to run computations over them. So this I think is going to be a huge focus for uh, the IPFS and Python communities in in 2023. Um, and in a special plug here for the uh, Computer over Data Working Group, which is an, an open working group uh, bringing together a lot of different uh, participants from um, from different communities to compute uh, to to kind of bring bring their different ways of doing this kind of uh, decentralized computation networks um, uh, uh, together to, to make sure that they're interoperable and all that kind of stuff. So I think like, this is a, a really promising area where we might, if we do things right in 23, we might generate um, an environment that can do you know, massive scale uh, data science experiments, and then finally kind of offer a faster, cheaper, um, and more interlinked and more reproducible alternative for scientists. And this could be like a really, really great result because at that point, the, the sort of like success of DSI could be one that is chosen out of um, kind of convenience and using better tools, which will, if we can achieve that, then it can spread um, to the whole world really quickly, right? So um, most um, scientific processing today happens in, in the cloud because it's just much more convenient and cheaper and so on. And so if we can beat that um, kind of structure and we can immediately put in the hooks and facilities to make the papers themselves themselves open access to make the data itself reproducible. Um, and we have all those kind of facilities linked up. I think that could be, um, end up with like a really, really great success. Uh, great. So I want to kind of finish with a broader call to action to, uh, folks around the world, which is to, you know, at the end of the day, all of this is going to work if we work together to, to enable this. So, um, join it, join up and, you know, try and create new funding mechanisms for, for science. Think of, um, experimenting with the ones already there, um, work on making open access tooling, work on making better data science tooling, um, work on public data sets, um, or, you know, consider joining one of the DSI teams or, or, um, or DAOs out there, uh, you know, at the other day, kind of, if we can make a, a better future, it'll come down to your participation there. All right. Uh, thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, I'm, I'm personally so excited to see how much our visions are aligned. This is, uh, this is just really fantastic. Uh, Let's just jump quickly into a few questions that we got from the audience in the meantime. So Chris Lemon is asking, what advice would you give to large traditional funding bodies to, mean, uh, to remain relevant uh, in the medium term? Uh, should they switch from panel reviews to something like quadratic funding? Or are there other things that you have in mind? How would you go about it? So I would, say I would recommend groups to um, experiment with different structures and I, I would really kind of emphasize trying to make the the algorithms that you use to do the deployment of, of funds and so on very explicit um, and kind of like experiment with different structures. Um, and I, I want to highlight like one one fund that I that I know is like highly innovative in this regard. So the Survival and Flourishing Fund is a a, a fund that was started by Jan Talen. Um, they fund dozens to hundreds of different groups. Uh, and they have a systematic process uh, where they um, uh, allocate certain funding over time, and then they use they hook into using the S process. I don't forget what the S stands for. Um, sigma process might it might be because it's like sort of like adding all, all the marginal um, uh, uh, distributions of all the different participants. But it, the, the broad point is um, by choosing to describe the way in which they're going to uh, make decisions by uh, committing themselves to experimenting with new structures and by being super open to suggestions from a broader group, that uh, that meta decision on its own um, has been super successful. And that's what I would kind of encourage a lot of these funding groups to do is, is to open the, open your structures up for suggestion and experiment with different ideas so you can get a, a good improvement rate going. So instead of kind of just saying, oh, great, just use, use quadratic funding and that's it, it's instead kind of like the meta experimental process, like just um, be willing to experiment with new ways of doing things, um, get a lot of feedback over time and improve your structure, um, you know, with every iteration that you're, that you're doing, um, and be very open to trying a lot of different algorithms out. And, you know, if you don't know what to try, um, or if you know what you want to try, but you're like worried that it may or may not work or whatever, reach out to the broader community to kind of, um, set up some, um, kind of a good experimental structure to then track your experiments over time and then be able to kind of reflect on, on the successes and failures that you see over time. Um, a good highlight of this would be the 
the COVID fast grants that um, were started then seeded the impetus fast grants and the repro fast grants and so on. So we've seen like many different grant programs replicating that success um, because it was so kind of well documented and articulated and the, the winnings were so clearly good that, um, uh, that many groups like have been able to reproduce this. So I think like get to that spot where you can experiment with your structures and you can involve a lot of other participants in, in making those decisions. Um, to the extent that you want to like go out there and like really try bringing in a lot of your participants in and using things like quadratic funding and so on, like, I think it could be great. Um, I think today we're kind of missing good tools for this. And so it could be like um, helping develop those tools might, might go a long way. Um, you know, how do you, you know, like today, if you, if you were to try and enable a lot of scientists to participate, say in an NSF grant pro program or whatever, like how would you do it? Would you tell them to like go and get, you know, a crypto key and install MetaMask and so on? Like that seems like just super, super hard, uh, but we can get much better tools where like, you know, we just kind of click a link, go to a website, sign in with whatever credentials they already have um, that authorize them in, in some platform and, um, and that's it. Um. I agree. Um, another question from, uh, from Shaya is uh, protocol labs doing anything in the life science ecosystem and how do you address the reproducibility issue? In the uh, great question. So um, we're working to, again, across a lot of different areas around funding mechanisms and ways in, in which people systematize the results um, and so on. So we're involved tangentially in that way, in the same way that we would be involved in many other groups by both improving some of the funding structures or improving the way in which people gather the results. Um, in life sciences in particular, um, people move around large scale data sets and their um, things like IPFS become extremely useful. Now the reproducibility here gets way harder. This is where um, I think things like um, Emerald Cloud Lab and so on are potentially super interesting, although Emerald Cloud Lab is not quite there for like full life sciences. I think it, it's more, um, you know, chemistry, like chemistry or like some biochemistry is like it works. Um, but that's kind of like the, the getting to a point where you can describe the experiments you're going to do in a reproducible setting where like you're, as you're describing the thing, you're writing a protocol that ideally should be able to be carried out by other parties who are not you. Like that, that's like the key component here. It's like you want to get, get the reproducibility, reproducibility of the thing articulated in such a way that many independent parties could run the exact same experiment. Um, and ideally you can use, you know, CROs or, um, or, or these kind of like automated um, cloud lab type settings to be able to, to do those experiments. Uh, but, you know, this is kind of like, I would say this is furthest, this is furthest away from, from working than, than a lot of the kind of purely digital experiments or um, experiments that are much closer to, you know, chemistry or like uh, physical sciences and so on. Totally. Okay. And I think we have time for one last question from the audience, uh, from Chris, who's asking, what do you think is the most compelling value proposition that these new Web3 tools uh, that you talked about could bring to scientists? The most compelling uh, contribution, I think, um, I'd say it's like two areas. One is systematizing things better and creating better coordination tools, meaning, um, so, so that's like coordinating the data better and then coordinating the people and the organizations better through, and this kind of funding mechanisms and whatnot. Um, and I think those are the two major contributions. Oh, I, I didn't quite articulate this earlier and I should have, um, where I think some of this is headed is that if crypto networks keep on their pace of, um, you know, over time with a kind of like the crypto summer and winters and so on, um, and they keep growing by a few orders of magnitude, um, if you have crypto networks at the scale of nation states, uh, I mean, already some crypto networks are exceeding the, the, the capital of some nations, like some small nations, but if this these crypto networks grow by two to three orders of magnitude or two to four orders of magnitude in terms of their, their value, then these crypto networks could be funding um, science and, and research and development at the scale of large scale nation states. And that's a super interesting potential. Uh, so that means if we see the same kind of growth in the 2020s that we saw in the last 10 years in terms of orders of magnitude um, in the crypto world, which is not hard to believe when you look at just the broad 
which is kind of like the, the, the um, there's this great graph from the visual capitalist that shows the different kind of scales of assets worldwide by different kind of forms. Um, uh, it's like a, one of these kind of highly recommended to view graphs in general. So you get a better understanding of how the world like d really does things and just sort of shows the relative sizes of different kinds of asset classes. So, um, you know, things like gold and, and different stocks in different, uh, um, or, or like real estate or derivatives or actual currency and so on. And cryptocurrency is just tiny in comparison with most asset classes out there. Like just, it's, it's a small fraction. So growing by two to four orders of magnitude is actually very realistic. Um, now, if we can do that, then crypto networks can start deploying their algorithmic structures to fund R&D properly at the scale of nation states. And like that, I think is extremely, extremely interesting. So if we can do the kind of um, better experimental structure and better, better systematic structure for how do we do, how do we allocate funding? And then we scale the success of uh, crypto networks. Then we end up with like a, like a, you know, um, a decentralized NSF type type institution or decentralized NIH type institution um, funding at that scale. And like that, I think would be extremely powerful. I totally agree. And this is actually one of the, one of the many topics that, uh, I'm really looking forward to dive into, uh, when we record our podcast at this point, thank you everybody for joining the seminar. Thank you Juan for, for giving this amazing and, uh, and inspiring talk. And then we invite you to join our next future of science seminar, which is on the 9th of January. We're Professor Marcus Monafo from the University of Bristol will talk about developing a theory of change for academic science. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Juan.